it actually is quicker to wipe with a proper <laughs> thing and okay thanks okay good to know okay so so technology is making progress at least to some degree um, get started. Um, yesterday we looked at um, the action functional and for mechanics this was simply the integral over the Lagrange function, which was a function of generalized coordinates and the velocities associated with these generalized coordinates. So that was in mechanics. Um, the same type of thing, the same idea, we can have for field theory, where the action functional so here it was a functional of the generalized coordinates. It was a functional, maybe I should say it more precisely, so let me get a little bit space. It was a functional of the generalized coordinates as a function of time. And here we now have in field theory a functional of the fields and it's not necessarily just one field. It can be a whole number of fields which depend on all space-time coordinates. So we have go from the generalized coordinates to fields, and we go from time to whole of space-time. And therefore, we also have to integrate over all of space-time. And we integrate over the Lagrange function or a Lagrange density, as it is often called which is, again, a function of the fields and derivatives of the fields. So for fields. What can we now do with this action functional? Well, we apply the Hamiltonian principle which tells us that the action is extremal. And how do we find extrema? Well, we do it as for ordinary functions. We take the derivative. Now we take the functional derivative. And we put it equal to 0. So the action is extremal. And the important part, and that's also something we learned yesterday, is this is a functional derivative. So we take one of these functionals, which are things that map all whole of functions onto numbers. So we take any function, we take any space-time dependence of phi and we map it onto one um, number. And functional derivatives, accordingly, are derivatives of this function with respect to the fields. OK. Um, we've also seen a first example of a field theory, which was classical electrodynamics. So now, let us look a little bit at a more general 
field theory. And let us simply look at a few properties of the Lagrange equations and the action. So let's go to 1.5. where we look at properties of the action and Euler-Lagrange equations. How does this actually work? Not very well, apparently. OK. Let's see how it continues. OK, so in general, we have already seen a specific example of this action with our electrodynamics. But in general, we take simply an action functional, which is the integral over the Lagrange density, which depends on phi and the first derivatives. In principle, it could depend also on higher derivatives. Um, and I'll comment on this possibility. But usually in physics, we restrict ourselves um, on a dependence on first derivatives. So what kind of properties does this action have? Well, um, this action, the first property is that it's a Lorentz scalar. So this Lagrangian density here is a Lorentz scalar. So we can see that simply from the fact that this has no Lorentz indices, if you want. So that's a very mm, simple way to see it. This thing shouldn't have any Lorentz indices. It should be a Lorentz scalar. Um, then, if we remember our example of electrodynamics, we had f mu nu squared. So remember example. Now this thing we already see has no Lorentz indices. And it came with something like minus 1 over 4. OK, so we can ask ourselves, what are the units or the mass dimensions of this action or of the Lagrange density and correspondingly the action? Well, this con contains electric and magnetic fields. So this is actually something like e squared minus b squared. And you can confirm that by doing one of the exercises. Now, another one of the exercises tells you that the electric fields have dimensions mass squared, as do the magnetic fields. And if you want, you could see that, that simply by looking at something like in the appropriate units, um, for example, the electric field of a point charge is something like Q times R divided by r cubed. And q is just a number. It's a, how many charges do we have? How many electron charges do we have? It's just a number. This has dimension length. This has dimension length cubed. So it's 1 over length squared. So it's mass squared in natural units, where we have put h bar equals c equals 1. And that's always important because, of course, if you don't do this, then the electric field um, will not have simply dimensions of mass squared. But if you put h bar equals c equals 1, then you get this mass. OK, so in this example, we see it's e squared. So this thing over here <coughs> has dimensions mass to the force. So the thing has dimensions. Um, L has dimensions mass to the force. And that makes sense, because this is, again, 1 over length to the force. And that makes it very nice, because 
now that we integrate over a four-dimensional volume, we find that S is dimensionless. It's a dimensionless number. And that basically already allows us to learn quite a lot about this Lagrangian. For example, there are not that many combinations um, which we can write down um, that give us a dimensionless number which is at the same time a Lorentz scalar. Of course, we can have dimensionful constants in front of um, terms, and we'll see that in a minute. But what we can definitely see, we always, if we write down some combination of fields, we can immediately guess what the dimension of the coefficient is for the Lagrangian to have the appropriate dimensions. OK. Um, so what properties do we have? In addition to that, we found it's a Lorentz scalar. But actually, it's more. Um, it's invariant. Um, under all symmetries. of the system. Or more precisely, the action is invariant is invariant under all symmetries of the system. So if we have a rotation symmetry, which is part of this Lorentz symmetry, if we rotate the system, then nothing changes. And that's one good um, symmetry um, for electrodynamics. And the the good thing, the equations of motion, which we will derive in a minute, automatically, so the equations of motion automatically inherit the appropriate transformation pr properties under the symmetries. Symmetries. So if, and once you have written down a Lagrangian that is invariant, and, or an action that is invariant under all symmetries of your system, you don't have to worry anymore. The equations of motion then automatically have the right transformation properties. And this invariance of the action severely restricts um, the allowed terms in the Lagrangian. So um, so the invariance under symmetries restricts the allowed terms. in the Lagrangian, or in the um, density and the action. How can we see that? Well, um, let us simply look back at our example. Um, well, f mu nu, f mu nu, is a nice Lorentz scalar. So that's a good one. Allowed by. So if we assume the thing is supposed to be Lorentz symmetric, this is a good term. But F mu nu, but just f mu nu is not. This is a tensor. So it's not a Lorentz scalar. Um, is excluded by Lorentz symmetry. So if we, 
our system has lower in symmetry than in the Lagrangian or in the action. We cannot have f mu nu alone. It should always come, say, with a second f mu nu or some other Lorentz vectors that make it an appropriate Lorentz scalar. Another example. Eraser. Another example of a useful symmetry we can have a theory with a symmetry which acts on the complex phase of a scalar field. So this is a scalar field, for example. Then we can multiply this scalar field by a constant phase. And we can simply say that the system is supposed to be <coughs> symmetric under this symmetry. So what kind of terms can we have in our Lagrange density? Well, for example, um, phi star phi is allowed. If we do that, the complex phase here simply drops out, simply gives us 1. But phi squared would give us something like e to the 2 times i alpha times um, phi. So this is forbidden. We can already see um, that symmetries um, quite strongly limit allowed terms. For example, we can also not write phi, um, phi cubed, and whatever. So it excludes quite a lot of um, possibilities if you have such a symmetry. So the strategy is to find the physical symmetries of a system, and then you can already exclude many, many terms from appearing in the Lagrangian. Um, moreover, and that's something you'll see pretty soon, is symmetries not only restrict the number of terms in the Lagrangian, but there's also a very deep connection um, to conserved quantities. OK, let me now try a special erasing tool. Oh, vanished. OK. Yeah, the system is currently being fine-tuned to become more and more user-friendly. So, OK. Um, what other properties do we have? Well, um, in a way, in classical mechanics, we had a direct connection between um, the Lagrangian and the kinetic and potential energies. And we have something very similar here. In field theory, we can have the action is now the space-time integral over something which is, or which could be taken as a kinetic energy density and a potential energy density. And very roughly speaking, it's really a kind of split as in classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, this bit contains the velocities of um, the particle, and this bit contained um, the coordinates, mostly. And for fields, this bit will contain the derivatives of the fields, in particular the time derivatives of the fields, which is something like a velocity but also the space derivatives, which you could say um, 
are now put on equal footing with the time derivatives. And this simply contains the fields themselves. At least in a lot of systems, we can do um, this kind of clear split between the two. So let us also again look at an example of this split. So we have our action for a theory which actually has the symmetry over here um, and which we can take to be d4x. And we simply take it d mu phi star, d mu phi minus m squared phi squared. Or maybe I should better write it. Um, as phi star phi. So this is a very simple action. So these derivatives correspond to the kinetic term and the non-derivative terms give you the potential energy. And we can also um, check our dimensions, because that's always a good check if we have written down something reasonable. Um, at first, we do not know what the dimension of a field is. So we do not know that from the beginning. But we can fix it by actually taking one term. And typically, you take um, the kinetic term and make it right. So a derivative is a, like dividing by a length. So we have two derivatives. So we have 1 over length squared. So we have 1 over length. <coughs> Here we have 1 over length. And our whole Lagrangian density should have 1 over length to the fourth power. So this thing over here should have 1 over length. And of course, the complex conjugate has the same as the field itself. So this thing has 1 over length. And then everything fits. In other words, it has dimensions of mass. OK, <laughs> now we can check with the second term. That's the non-trivial cross-check. Mass, another mass. So what's the dimension of this m squared? Well, we can say this is 1 over length if we want. 1 over length. So again, we need two 1 over length squared, or if you want, a mass squared. So m itself, if I don't square it, has dimensions of mass. So this is really appropriately called a mass term in the Lagrangian. Um, but you see how it goes. You start from one term, typically the kinetic term, and then you can determine the dimensions of the fields, and from this, the appropriate dimensions for all the prefactors um, in the following terms. OK. Um, now that we have seen um, a few properties of this Lagrangian, let us return to the Euler-Lagrange equations and see if we can actually get a more general Euler-Lagrange equation than just the question, basically, if we have to derive the Euler-Lagrange equation each time by taking the functional derivative of the action and works through all the steps, or let's do it once in a rather general fashion. Yeah? So uh, the action is then uh, dimensional. Which, what is dimension? The, the action is dimensionless. Yeah. And that's always the goal, basically making the action dimensionless. The so Lagrange density <coughs> has dimensions of mass to the fourth, or length to the um, minus four. And that cancels again these 
this volume factor. OK. So we start, we want to have, oh, now I could clear everything here. Ah, I think hmm. I have the impression that it already cleared everything. So we want to have. If you want general Euler Lagrange equations. Okay, so we start from the Hamiltonian principle. Let me write this very um, schematically for any form of the action. That's the Hamiltonian principle. Um, now, let us get the general equation of motion by really going through the steps for a general action. And you can always think of this phi now representing a whole bunch of fields labeled by an index, but I'll not write down all the indices. So we take the action functional as d for x, Lagrange function phi, and dependent only on the first derivative. So that's the one restriction we put on. And then we can <coughs> do our functional derivatives. And this also serves as a practice of how to do these functional derivatives. Now, as in classical mechanics, we simply take the partial derivative with respect to the field of the Lagrangian density. And then we have to take the functional derivative of phi with respect to phi. So and I should probably put a prime over here. Um, but if I do that, say phi of x prime, phi delta of phi of x, we already know that this is delta x prime minus x. Similarly, we have for the second term the partial derivative with respect to the derivative of the field, and then um, we get the same delta function, but as last time, we have the d mu remains here, and then we have um, the derivative acting on the delta function. OK, let me continue over here. So having the right-hand side, it's again exactly the same steps as in classical mechanics. This derivative acting on the delta function is something we have trouble dealing with. So we do a partial integration to get it over here. So we do partial integration, and we get <coughs> phi minus, because of the partial integration, d mu dl. D, d mu phi <coughs> and so far nobody has complained but let me just mention as a little side remark um, if we do a partial integration of something we typically 
have some boundary terms. We have to, we typically have the thing without um, any derivative as the boundary terms. Usually, um, the physical assumption is to say again, all fields are nice, drop off at infinity sufficiently fast um, such that we have no boundaries that all the boundary terms vanish identically. And that's why we can do that. Um, just as a note, and you'll probably encounter um, some of this later on when people are start to talk, talking about um, topology and things like that. It's a very recent development, say, about 30 years, the last 30 years, that in some cases, in some special cases, um, these boundary terms can actually become important. And that's um, what typically um, goes under the um, name of topology in physics and things like instantons and solitons and so on. But here, we'll simply assume that everything is sufficiently nice and we can drop um, these boundary terms. OK, so we have done our partial integration. We have removed the dangerous derivative on the delta function, and now we can perform our integration. So this is simply dl by d phi evaluated, if you want, at x. And same thing as d mu dl by d, d mu phi, also evaluated at x, equal 0. And these are the, the right-hand side is, again, our Hamiltonian principle from here. So these are the Euler-Lagrange equations for fields. So having understood the action principle and knowing how to do functional derivatives makes it quite straightforward um, to make the transition from um, classical mechanics to um, field theory. OK, let me now make just a brief comment. Let me probably also erase the whiteboard in the middle um, while I make this comment. As I said, we have restricted ourselves um, to the first derivatives in the fields. Why do we do that? Well, if you look at this Euler-Lagrange equation and you try it out for a few examples, you'll find that this Euler-Lagrange equation gives you a second order um, differential equation. Basically, this derivative already indicates that you have one derivative, but typically um, this term over here gives you another derivative, so you have a second derivative acting on the field. So it's a second order differential equation. Now, if you go to higher derivatives in your Lagrangian, if you add higher derivative terms, <coughs> you'll get more and more derivatives in your um, Euler-Lagrange equations. And if you have more derivatives, that means um, you need more initial conditions. So two derivatives roughly means two initial conditions. Three, you need three, and so on. So you need more and more initial conditions. So basic, so that's something um, we don't really like, So because you, your system becomes less and less specified. But Maybe nature is not to our liking, but there's another physical reason why um, higher derivatives are dangerous. And you can explore this um, reason by doing one of the exercises. I think it's 1.5 or 6, whatever. Um, if you have um, these equations of motion which have more than two derivatives, typically you'll find unstable solutions things that grow exponentially. And that's something extremely dangerous. It's like your energy often has a tendency to blow up. or you, In particular, 
your fields do not decay towards infinity, but they may grow exponentially fast. And that makes it very difficult um, to get reasonable, finite things for things like energies or energy densities. Yes? Well, but then what is a good physical reason for excluding um, these? In principle, you should be able to treat all the solutions on the same footing. And quite often, you may have only exponentially blowing up um, solutions. So it's a very dangerous thing. You have to um, care. So it's not completely excluded. It's just very dangerous. In principle, there are systems that are well behaved despite having higher derivatives. And basically, that you are restricted to first order derivatives is a bit of a kind of um, standard law for simple systems. Um, it's not a fundamental law. Um, in some situations, it might be useful. Um, however, the funniest thing is, in most cases, when you have a higher derivative mm, action that, which contains more um, derivatives than just first order, what you actually find, and if it is well behaved, what you actually find is that you can insert an additional field, which basically is the derivative of the original field, and which then appears as an independent field in the action and which is only first order derivatives. So you can rewrite everything in terms of first order derivative. So basically then, in these cases, the higher derivatives actually physically indicate um, that you're actually not dealing with one field or one degree of freedom, so to speak, but you're actually having two or more. A and these types of higher derivatives are, of course, well behaved because a system with two degrees of freedom is something we can ha physically have. Um, so this gives you already a special class, if you want, of higher derivative series, which is OK. But then you actually don't need the higher derivative. And you, would, you get a better physical picture by doing it in first order. And finally, but that's getting a little bit ahead, <laughs> um, the more derivatives you have, ah, I already erased it. But each derivative um, corresponds to um, a higher, so a derivative has dimensions mass. So if you add more and more derivatives, the mass dimension of your, op of your um, term in your Lagrangian grows and grows. So if you have, say, m squared phi squared and say plus d mu phi squared. Now, if you want to add a term with, so these two have each nicely dimension 4. Um, here you have a mass squared parameter in front. Here you have a 1 in front. But now you want to have a d mu, d mu, d rho phi squared operator. So this thing has 1, 2, 3, 4, mass dimension 8. So this is proportional to mass to the eighth power. So you have to have a coefficient here which has dimensions of 1 over mass to the fourth. And in quantum field theory, everything, every coefficient which has negative mass dimension is quite bad. This causes evil divergencies. So that's a quantum field theory reason why you not necessarily like um, having higher derivatives in your Lagrangian. OK. Um, but in the exercises, you can practice a little bit with a few higher derivative um, theories. OK. Let me erase again this thing. OK. Let us briefly summarize all the nice properties um, we have found for the ac action and um, all the nice features we have discovered. So 
let's simply make a list of nice properties and reasons why we like the action. Um, it's something very general. X taking X of T as a field So basically taking the coordinates of a point particle as dependent on its time as a field, um, we find that classical, if, if we simply call this a field of one coordinate, we can actually say that classical mechanics is completely the same as a field theory in one time dimension and zero space dimensions. So classical mechanics is actually a field theory, but it's a field theory that lives on a lower dimensional space. Before, we simply compare to phi of x. So now x becomes our field value, t is our coordinate, and we only have a time coordinate. So classical mechanics is a 1 plus 0 dimensional field theory. Oops. This is also not super clean. OK. Then, um, what is also nice about it, um, all classical field theories can be formulated by giving the action. It's something extremely general. In this or in the next term, you have general relativity. Now I'll give you my brief version of general relativity. It's space-time integral and that's general relativity. Well, that's simply the action of general relativity. It looks quite simple. Why spend a whole course on it? Well, um, the question is, what is R and what is G? Um, but the bottom line is general relativity, our theory of gravity, can be summarized in something extremely simple. And now we can even add a little bit of cosmology. We can add, for example, a quintessence. That's one of the fields used to explain dark energy. And you simply take the same action and add a scalar field, which we already encountered, minus a potential. That's general relativity with a cosmological dark energy field. And my whole point is, you don't need to understand the details, but the action for this quite complicated subject is a very um, simple object. And the reason why it's so simple, because all symmetries trees are built in. Um, meaning symmetric action, we automatically get um, that the equation of motions have the right properties. And the reason why this action for general relativity is so simple is simply because, well, 
the symmetry of general relativity is huge. It puts a lot of restrictions on the Lagrangian, so not many terms survive um, this um, strict cut. And we'll want to now branch off in a slightly different direction. Um, That's another nice property which we'll explore in the next few weeks. Lagrangian or the action is a nice starting point. for quantization. We can do it two ways. And we'll do mostly, or we'll actually exclusively do the first way. We can do it indirectly, meaning we take the Lagrangian and derive the Hamiltonian. That is typically the other approach we can take to mechanics or uh, also to field theory. And if you remember your quantum mechanic course, um, you typically talked about the Hamiltonian, um, which you used to quantize, quantize um, your system. But the most straightforward a um, way to get the Hamiltonian in a field theory is actually to derive the Hamiltonian from the Lagrangian. And then we go ahead and quantize. Well, that's one way to quantize a field theory. But we can also do it directly by, and that um, will be discussed in detail in the quantum field theory course, by using the path integral formulation. And just as a brief glimpse ahead, quantum field theory, so to speak, is given by an integral, and now that's the, the kind of inverse of our functional derivatives. It's a functional integral. And that's where the action comes in, of an exponential where the phase is determined by our action functional. And here you can really see how central the action is in quantum field theory. And that is what I already mentioned when I briefly gave you this example of the different passes, you add basically all different passes weighted by this complex um, phase. OK. And finally, and that's another reason you'll encounter again in the quantum field theory course, we'll do this first step, but there is more to it, yeah? In, the, in general, yeah. Uh, you wrote delta t. Yeah. So this is, well, this will be explained in more detail in the quantum field theory course. But this is basically this integral is the equivalent, or well, in Ordinary analysis, you have derivatives, and integration is kind of the inverse operation. And we've already encountered functional derivatives, and this is the appropriate functional integral. That kind of, you're now not integrating over numbers, but you're integrating over the whole function space. Um, this is quite difficult to calculate in a way. 
But the idea is basically you again sum, so you have, say, all. Hmm? Is it what? I didn't understand you acoustically. Sorry. What is the variation? No, I'm not quite sure what you mean, but basically it is really like an integral. In, in ordinary integration, you sum over the little pieces of the coordinates. Basically, you sum over from here to here, from here to here, and so on. In function space, you also change the function each time a little bit, and you sum over all these um, little bits and pieces. Okay, but let's proceed. Um, and that's, again, a little bit beyond what we'll do in this course. But it's good to know, because that's quite often implicitly it's assumed. Um, in quantum field theory, one can calculate a thing called effective action. which is often called gamma, which is a functional, but you could say it's a functional of the expectation value of the quantum fields. And then, you go ahead and do classical field theory, meaning you derive the classical equations of motion with gamma and the expectation value of the field. So basically, you treat the expectation value of the quantum field as a classical field. And if you use this effective action, you basically already include a whole bunch of quantum effects. So basically, um, if you have this thing, you can do quantum field theory without actually doing it by simply doing classical field theory. But of course, the difficult part is to calculate this effective action. But in many situations, it's doable to get at least a reasonable approximation. And once you have that, it becomes much easier um, to derive observable physical effects and to understand um, actual macroscopic effects and how they are affected by um, quantum mechanics. OK, so I think that's good point um, to stop for today. So today, basically, we've really kind of collected quite a few properties of the action and the um, Lagrangian density, um, basically, with, on the one hand, which help you to actually mm, take um, the action and then calculate the equation of motion. But on the other hand, also, um, what's the physical um, reasons why the action is a good thing to use, and how you can actually um, restrict the terms that appear in your Lagrangian. You may actually start from some few symmetry principles and simply write down all the terms you can imagine. And if you put an, in enough restrictions, that will give you already your complete field theory and define it. Basically, what people have done here is they have put in the restriction which is given by the symmetries of general relativity and add the additional restrictions that you take only um, those terms which have the lowest mass dimension or the most, most positive, well, it's not positive, the least negative mass dimension in terms of general relativity. And only one term survived, and that's general relativity. So it's really crucial to 
Think about the fact you, you specify some symmetries, and that tells you everything already about the dynamics of the system. Okay, so then see you tomorrow.